I'm Matt Doran. Australia's robust democracy sees many fierce, bitter rivalries between our politicians. And we've seen loud and violent public protests and even the occasional riot. But physical attacks on political figures are extremely rare. Which is why shockwaves echoed across the nation when news broke out that a sitting member of parliament had been shot dead outside his Sydney home. The suburb of Cabramatta in Sydney's southwest is home to tens of thousands of migrants who've made it a true cultural melting pot. In the 1940s and 50s, the suburb and the surrounding Fairfield City area is settled by hard-working migrants from southern Europe, part of Australia's massive post-World War II immigration boom. One of Cabramatta's favourite sons is from an Italian family the boxing champion Rocky Gattolari, who electrifies fight fans in the 1960s. In 1967, millions are thrilled by his brave battle with the rising star of Australian boxing, Lionel Rose. Their Australian bantamweight title fight lasts 13 brutal rounds. While Rocky battles it out in the ring, another brutal confrontation is taking place, the Vietnam War. At the end of that conflict in the 1970s, tens of thousands of Vietnamese refugees flocked to Australia and many established themselves in Cabramatta. As a result, by the 1980s, the suburb is home to one of Australia's biggest Indo-Chinese communities. But the turbulent resettlement also means it becomes a haven for drugs, violence and corruption. Standing rock solid against new local crime gangs is the area's courageous member of state parliament, <laughs> whose brave stance will lead to Australia's first political assassination. For more than 15 years, the controversial war rages between North Vietnam and the United States-backed South Vietnam, with tens of thousands of American and Australian troops fighting on the side of the South. In 1975, after American and Australian troops have pulled out, the North takes over. Hordes of refugees flee their homeland. Men, women and children spend weeks aboard leaky boats, with many dying in the desperate attempt to reach freedom. One of the many thousands looking for economic and political freedom is this man, Fong No, whose grit and determination eventually pays dividends. He stages no less than 13 attempts to escape before he finally makes it by boat to Malaysia. From there, he's granted refugee status to come to Australia, settling in Cabramatta. Fong No is highly intelligent, well-educated and from a once well-to-do family. But he arrives in Australia penniless. Today, Cabramatta is a thriving suburb filled with Asian businesses, shops and restaurants. In fact, in some ways, it resembles a city in Vietnam. It's an authentic Asian experience. You can walk there in complete safety. But back in the 1990s, Vietnamese crime gangs were running riot. Five men wearing samurai headbands and armed with guns burst into the home at five this morning. In the early 90s, Gary Raymond is an inspector of police stationed at Cabramatta. We got overdoses on the hour, every hour. Uh, deaths, uh, there was a number of shootings and murders there. Uh, they were using meat cleavers from restaurants and knives from restaurants to have knife fights. There was, um, you know, the train would pull up and there was a whole raft of people get off the train, get the heroin. And it was just, the resources weren't coming in there and commander after commander tried to get the resources. The public is angry and demands politicians and police do more. One of those campaigning hardest is John Newman, a tough-talking, hard-working, no-nonsense politician, determined that these Vietnamese gangs be crushed at all costs. The Asian gangs involved don't fear our laws. 
but there's one thing that they do fear, and that's possible deportation back to the jungles of Vietnam, because that's where, frankly, they belong. John Newman comes from an immigrant Yugoslav family and has anglicised his surname from Naumenko. He suffers an enormous personal tragedy when his pregnant wife and young son are killed in a car accident. He has become a driven and single-minded man. After the tragedy, he eventually finds some happiness when he becomes engaged to his electoral office secretary, Lucy Wang. John has been politically active since the 1970s, becoming a member of the Australian Labor Party and then deputy mayor of the local Fairfield Council. By 1994, he's represented the seat of Cabramatta in the New South Wales Parliament for eight years. But what he used to do is, um, I mean, see, confront dealers, um, confront, you know, drug users and literally tell them to get to rehab or get out of Cabramatta. He made a lot of enemies, as a lot of people uh, really wanted to get rid of him from not only the, you know, I guess the political scene, but the drug, um, the drug scene itself, because he was an obstruction and he, he did cause things to happen to either displace some of the dealers or certainly make it very uncomfortable. And he was threatened many times. One of his enemies is none other than Vietnamese immigrant Phong Ngo. By 1994, Ngo has become a Fairfield councillor and has built up wealth, power and influence within the Cabramatta community. And he's determined to go even further. His quick transformation from poor immigrant to wealthy mover and shaker is a source of pride to him and wonderment to others. The late Shirley Barrett at the time was a fellow Fairfield councillor and one-time supporter who knew Fong Ngo well. And it just seemed strange at the time, and it still does seem strange, from arriving as a, as a penniless uh, refugee to now being known as a millionaire. Well, Fung's political ambition and aspirations is eventually to become a senator. But at the time, I think that the first step was to get through to the state, state seat. Fong Ngo covets John Newman's state parliamentary seat of Cabramatta. But John is well established and has a strong supporter base and has already blocked Ngo from becoming mayor of Fairfield. Ngo clearly sees Newman as a solid obstacle. John was very active in relation to try to counter the Fong Ngo influence within Cabramatta. We've seen him nothing more than as a crook. Um, so they tried to level the same charges as John, but John was out there all the time fighting the crime and trying to get police action. He'd had the cameras up every week. Um, with something that's gone wrong in Cabramatta, whether it had been extortion, a murder, a knifing, or a home invasion. And those things were becoming more prevalent then. And um, we, just, we just had a just funny feeling in the back of our mind that Fung was behind most of it. For Fong Ngo, the animosity is far more than just political. Ruthlessly ambitious, he takes Newman's opposition to him as a personal insult. What follows culminates in violence that strikes at the heart of Australian democracy. Vietnamese refugee Phong Ngo and State Member of Parliament John Newman have become bitter rivals. When Ngo stands as an independent candidate against John Newman in the 1991 state elections, Newman trounces him. So, determined to beat Newman once and for all, Phong Ngo joins the Australian Labor Party, sets up a new local branch and recruits members. What Cabramatta needs is a strong sense of leadership, a person who can unite the community and work for the rebuilding of a better Cabramatta. Are you going yes. to vote for me? Yes. Yes? Yes? Thank you. Thank you very much. 
In 1993, Governor-General Bill Hayden officially opens the Mekong Club, a licensed premises for the Indo-Chinese community in Cabramatta. No is its honorary president, and the Mekong Club becomes his castle. He graces his friends with jobs at the club, and himself with largesse. With about 100 poker machines, the club becomes not just a centre of entertainment, but a huge money generator. It's also a place for the 5T Asian gangsters to meet and plot. The gang is involved in drug dealing, extortion, home invasions, and even worse, murder. He established his own political party within the Mekong Club. Tung Nao used the Mekong Club as his headquarters. That was his club, shall we say. He was never a director on the board, but yet he got all the money and rang the club from another office in John Street, not from the club itself. Newman succeeds in forcing official inquiries into Fong No's activities involving the club. The authorities find irregularities and ban No from holding any position in any licensed club. Newman has won another round against his arch rival. It's around this time that Newman is the target of a series of sinister events. There are break-ins at his electoral office, his car is vandalised and he begins receiving telephone calls like this. You're dead, Newman. We can do. You're dead, Newman. At his home and office. Yeah, John had a number of threats that he reported to us, but didn't stop him. This bloke was courageous. This fellow was um, put politics aside and uh, he was an advocate for his area. He was, um, uh, no one worried him. He was, there was not a person on earth he was frightened of. There really wasn't. And so uh, I guess that made him a, a target. Uh, whereas, you know, some politicians who were lesser assertive uh, were sort of tolerated and in fact didn't interrupt the whole thing. John Newman has become a major problem for the criminals of Cabramatta and also for Fong No. Then a disagreement over what many consider a minor matter, the construction of an ornate oriental gateway, brings the contest between the two men to boiling point. Fong wanted a sister city arrangement to made with Taiwan uh, very early in the piece. And we thought the most appropriate way was to have a sister city with, with the mainland Chinese. After all, they were the majority within the Cabin Matter electorate at that time. And um, so Fung was dead against this. He had his cohorts um, all supporting him with this Taiwanese thing. At the end of the day, um, I think the whole lot has to come down to money. We believe that Fung was able to gain a hell of a lot of money from, for various projects from Taiwan. Taiwan wanted its own little identity within Sydney. Cabin Matter was ideal. The majority of fellow Fairfield councillors support Fong No, but John Newman continues to oppose him. Supremely confident of his standing within the community and his influence within the Labor Party and the state government, No considers himself untouchable. There was some um, talk at the time that Fung was going to help the Labor Party raise enough money to get out of some of their consolidated debts that they had at the time and also help raise money for the party itself. Fong No decides he must stop John Newman. Filled with jealousy and greed and desperate for more power, he decides there's only one solution. Newman has to die. Amazingly, Fong No has no qualms about approaching several employees at the Mekong Club, offering them thousands of dollars to assassinate his political opponent. <clears throat> Around mid-1994, there are several aborted murder plans. Two fail because the hired killers get cold feet when they discover the identity of the high-profile target. In another attempt, the would-be killers wait outside John's home, ready to strike. When he doesn't arrive home by midnight, they decide to leave and try again later. On Saturday, September 3, 1994, 
Fong No insists that the hit must take place in a couple of days. And that night, the assassins do a dry run, driving past John's house. Fong No follows them in his own car and shadows their every move. John Newman's days are numbered. On the night of September 5th, 1994, John Newman returns to his Cabramatta home after attending a political meeting at the Cabra Vale Diggers Club. The following morning, Australians will wake to the news that a member of parliament, John Newman, has been assassinated. The assassination of Cabramatta Member of Parliament John Newman on the night of September 5, 1994 is the culmination of a bitter power grab by Phong No, a former Vietnamese refugee and local councillor. Newman's neighbour, Derek Murfin, is at home on that Monday night and hears gunshots. I walked straight to the front door and opened it and immediately heard a woman screaming. <laughs> Murfin looks outside and then calls triple zero. My words to the operator were, uh, my neighbour, Mr John Newman, MP, has been shot. There's a woman screaming. I can see a car moving slowly. It appears to be a dark blue or green XD Ford Falcon. Get you as quick as you can. Murfin rushes to the scene just 50 metres away and finds Newman slumped near his front door. I was with him for about 30 seconds and he stopped breathing. I'd evaluated him, his skin was cold and clammy, his lips were blue, his fingers were going cold, his face was cold. John, can you hear me? He had blood in the bottom of his mouth and a smear of blood in his teeth. And the first thing I noticed when I knelt down beside him was a hole in the left armpit. I looked further hole in the right one, the arm, and I thought he'd got one straight through the top of the chest. As Murfin works desperately on the mortally wounded Newman, Lucy Wang is inside on her knees, screaming hysterically to the triple-O operator. <laughs> by now, other neighbours are in the street, completely stunned by what they are witnessing. First response police are quickly on the scene and they too are shocked when they realise a sitting member of parliament has been shot dead. Inspector Gary Raymond arrives at the scene. And I saw two young police officers had already arrived and uh, John's body was on his back and the two police officers were resuscitating him. Looked over and I saw Lucy, she was on the front steps of the house just crying and screaming hysterically. And I looked around and saw some spent cartridges in the vicinity of the driveway. And uh, the colour just drained from her face. I thought, where's the shooter? And I mean, many things run through your mind. Is the shooter in the house? Is it someone that's there at the scene? Is it, was it a drive-by? Is it someone, is it a neighbour? Um, and so with that I just quickly went down, recognised it was John and I immediately knew, um, politician, sadly shot, this is going to be huge. One, two, three, four, I glanced down and I saw uh, a wound, uh, probably an exit wound from his chest and it was what we call a sucking chest wound and uh, there was froth and blood coming out of it sadly and as the police officers resuscitated him, um, because of my ambulance and rescue squad experience in the past, I knew that the projectile had probably gone through his heart or through his you know, thoracic aorta or something like that. One, two, three, four, five. After arriving home from a party meeting at around 9, witnesses say an unlit car cruised up to the house, then a series of shots were fired 
to hitting Mr Newman in the chest. Front veranda, they attempted to get him the cardio. Police believe the killers may have followed Mr Newman home. Police must now break the terrible news to John Newman's family. When the police knocked on my door, I thought, no, no, it couldn't be. And he said, we're working on him, we're working on him. And then my son said, no, mum, he's gone. I don't know, I don't know, I just broke down. I just broke down. Because uh, uh, that news was the worst in my life. John Newman's confidant, Ken Chapman, had been at the political meeting with Newman earlier that night. He receives the news and rushes to the crime scene. I spoke to police by, in my statement that evening and um, they asked me who I thought would have been capable or wanting to kill John Newman. I only had one person in mind, that was Fung Ngo. Within hours of the execution, a multi-agency task force gap is established as crime scene investigators search the area for clues and also interview John's fiancée, Lucy Wang. It's her information that provides police with the clear picture of how he was killed. John! The first shot hit him and spun him round about 180 degrees and then the second shot hit him also, so there was two wounds uh, to the chest area which were fatal. And the other two shots, uh, one hit the car and one hit the roof of the carport. Fortunately, Lucy Wang, who was standing at the front of the motor vehicle, was not injured. We established from Lucy Wang that uh, she observed this murder, a single gunman who appeared to be a young person of Asian appearance, very thin build, wearing an army jacket, um, stood at the entrance to the carport and fired four shots from a, uh, what we believe to be a 32 uh, automatic pistol. She then saw the gunman uh, race to a green coloured falcon and get into the passenger's door and the vehicle sped off. The whole murder sequence happened just in a matter of minutes and uh, John Newman was dead. Several witnesses told detectives they saw two cars in the area before the shooting and that both then sped off. They described a green car which they believed carried the shooter and a getaway driver and a white Toyota Camry. From the early evidence, investigators are certain this is a contract killing. But who did it and what was the motive? Newman's family and friends all name the ambitious Fong No as someone with a very strong motive to kill him. However, police are also aware that others, including members of the notorious 5T gang, also have a motive to rid themselves of the anti-crime crusader. Two days later, Fong No and fellow Fairfield councillors fly to Taiwan on the Sister City mission. Police have not yet interviewed No. The late Shirley Barrett, a one-time Fong No supporter, was shocked by No's reaction. Well, it just troubled me that people who were supposedly members of the same political party could be virtually pleased to know that, that the, the state member had actually been um, murdered, assassinated, or whatever you'd like to, like to refer to it as. And, and I, I just think that it was in terribly bad taste that people would be laughing about such a thing. Who was laughing? Who, who was making these comments? Full no. When the delegation returns from Taiwan a week later, police meet Fong No at the airport and ask him to accompany them to their office at Cabramatta Police Station to answer some questions. No readily agrees, but when they arrive, the media is there in force and the prime suspect holds an impromptu press conference. Do you have any clue who killed Mr Newman? It's not up to me to make speculation, and if I know, that I, I would talk to the police. One of Fong No's interrogators is Detective Wayne Walpole. The first few days of the, um, of the task force gap being set up, 
uh, we'd received a wealth of information uh, in relation to um, conflicts between John Newman and, and uh, Fong No. During the interrogation, No gives some detailed answers regarding his movements at the time of the shooting. He claims to have been at the Mekong Club with friends before calling several colleagues on the car phone while driving home. On the way home now. No's colleagues and cohorts confirm the phone calls. His cronies at the Mekong Club also corroborate his alibi that he was at the club at the time of the murder, but they said little else. Detectives come up against the traditional community wall of silence. But despite this, some information does trickle through. There, there was an attempt or um, a dry run, uh, you might say, the Saturday night before. Information came to the task force that um, that Fong No was identified actually in a street behind Newman's house um, late at night at 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, his car was uh, identified. He was identified standing outside his car. So, and that was pretty significant because during uh, the first interview, we'd locked New, um, Fong No into the fact that he'd never been anywhere near uh, John Newman's um, house. Um, had no reason to go there. Detective Ian McNabb has retrieved spent cartridges from the crime scene and has had them examined. Initially, um, our ballistics expert, uh, Detective Sergeant Graham North, um, he identified the shell casings that were used um, at the shooting. Now, these are unusual shell casings as they had a flat firing pin. Um, Graham had not seen that before in, uh, in Australia and he made some inquiries overseas. Um, it turned out that Beretta made a, um, a 32 calibre pistol in 1934 and 1935 for the Italian army and that, uh, that weapon actually had a flat firing pin. In the first few months, detectives interview hundreds of people. But other than speculation and a strong gut feeling, there is little evidence to tie Fong No or anyone else to the murder. It's time to talk to the main suspect again. Uh, in the first interview, he, he locked down the, the point that, um, um, you know, he was at the Mekong Club at a certain time for his staff meeting, and then he went across to his newspaper office and, uh, and then back to the Mekong Club. And he was very specific as to where he, he um, parked his car and, uh, and had um, left his car keys or if he had his car keys on him. And, of course, um, when, during the second interview, when we started painting, a, painting him into a corner, um, he was um, trying to backtrack from a lot of the answers he'd given, realising that um, certainly his car um, was going to play a, a bit of a part uh, in his downfall. Dear friends, we hear the mourn a good Australian and honour a brave man. On September 5, 1994, State Member of Parliament John Newman is shot dead by an assassin in front of his fiancée, Lucy Wang, outside their Cabramatta home. The investigation is long and difficult. The months turn into years. Then, more than three years after the murder, the doggedness of investigators starts to pay off. Some previously reluctant witnesses begin coming forward. One gives detectives vital information about how Fong No had approached him and others to obtain firearms and carry out a hit. This witness is granted immunity from prosecution and witness protection in return for his evidence. The witnesses also name others they allege had been part of the assassination plot. Police are told of the earlier aborted attempts on Newman's life and that Fong No had approached someone at the Mekong Club after the murder and whispered, I did it. Yeah, yeah I did it. Um, it took a while because it was very hard to break through the, um, that, um, the, the culture and the fear factor in, in Cabramatta at that time. Speculation is rife and a Sydney newspaper runs a story suggesting Fong No was connected with the deadly 5T gang leader Tree Min Tran. 
Tran has died in gang-related violence, and the story appears after No attends his funeral. The story also suggests that No had once offered Tran $10,000 to kill John Newman, but Tran declined. Naturally, Fong No denies this. Did you ever offer Tri Min Tran money? No. To never. kill John Newman? Not for whatever purposes. Tri Min Tran never asked me for any money, and I have never offered Tri Min Tran any money for whatever purposes at all. As the investigation wore on, those close to John Newman are becoming anxious. The pain is there always, you know. I, for the three years, the pain can never go away. It's very frustrating that um, there's nothing has been done yet. But Lucy, who is by now living in China, doesn't know that the police net is gradually closing in on her fiancé's killer. By February the 1st, 1998, three and a half years after the murder, police decide to take their evidence to the coroner. The inquest lasts six weeks. The police present evidence and testimony that casts an enormous doubt over the alibis of Fong No, as well as his suspected co-conspirators and Mekong Club employees. The protected witness alleges that Fong No was the mastermind, that a man named Tu Kwong Dao, owner of a green Ford Fairlane, was a getaway driver, and that a Mekong Club employee, whose name has been suppressed, was a third accomplice. Detectives tell the coroner that after raiding the employee's home, they found an army-style jacket, which later tested positive to gunpowder residue. A telecom expert tells the coroner that with new technology, he could now more accurately pinpoint oh, Fong No's mobile phone activity at the times in question, and it was not where No had claimed to be. The suspects refused to take the witness stand. Within hours of the inquest ending, detectives finally charge Fong No and two others with conspiracy to murder. A magistrate grants Fong No bail, but keeps the other two in custody. The police case has strengthened. Advances in telecommunications technology since John Newman's death in 1994 have aroused the interest of investigators. This leads to the breakthrough that gives them a vital lead to the assassin. No continues to deny having anything to do with the Newman killing, as do his co-accused. No is still confident he'll beat the charges. But he has not counted on this new mobile phone technology that will expose his string of lies. I established that uh, there were three main phones used at the Mekong Club. One was a fixed phone in Fung No's car, which was a white Toyota Camry. That was a fixed mobile phone. Uh, there were two other ones that were available to the club. One was normally utilised by the operations manager of the club and the other one was Fung's personal phone. From that we made some inquiries as to the usage of those phones and, and established that there had been a flurry of activity on not only the Monday night but the Saturday night in the local area. From that we looked at um, telecom experts and the towers that were used, um, the towers that the, the, the mobile phones connected to. From there, we could basically establish um, the direction where, where the uh, within a, a 5k radius of where some of our, uh, these phones were, uh, and we utilised that as part of the investigation. What we established was, particularly with Fung No, was that he um, had stated when he was interviewed that he was on his way home to his house at Bonnie Rig. Um, we also established that uh, during that time he had two phone calls with Shirley Barrett, and there was another. Uh, phone call to one of the other Mekong club phones. Hello, Shirley. It's fine here. How are you? Shirley yes, Barrett uh, uh, advised us that uh, Fung had told her he was on his way home. How did you go However, the phones didn't really uh, establish that. It actually showed that the phones were going in an opposite direction to the um, Bonnie Rig, more than likely down Cumberland Highway through Liverpool. Um, and a, a final call was um, connected uh, through a cell tower in Hammondville. Even though he now faces a conspiracy to murder charge, 
Fong No still goes about his daily business, following his political ambitions as though nothing has happened. He'd walk down the street with the, after the murder with the new member for Cabramatta, Reba Maher, and also one of the mayors, Nick Lalich, you know, to try and make him look, I'm a great guy, look at me, but um, powerful friends. Fong No's supreme arrogance is only matched by the investigators' determination to continue examining his alibi. Detectives are now using the new technology to study telecom records dating back almost four years, plotting his movements on the night of the murder and the times of his calls. We'd made maps uh, in relation to the movements of the phones. From that we worked out well, a possibility that uh, the reason why Fung was travelling that way was maybe to dispose of the murder weapon. He was trying to create an alibi with um, Shirley good. Barrett. He was talking that? to her. There was an upcoming trip to oh, Taiwan, and he was talking that's to her about that trip to Taiwan. Um, fortunately for us, I suppose the phone dropped out and the phone call had to be recommenced, so that gave us two calls. As I said earlier, there was another call as well. By those calls, we could actually trace the direction the phone was going. We could put it in, in a particular area for a cell tower. Therefore, uh, myself and another officer uh, did a canvas of the area and, and of where the phone directions were. Out of that, we established maybe two locations of bridges where perhaps uh, the weapon could have been thrown from. Divers begin searching in the murky waters under a bridge over the Georges River in southwestern Sydney. They hunt for two days and finally, success. They find a heavily rusted 1934 Beretta pistol that's been lying there for more than three years. Australian investigators can't positively identify the gun as the same 1934 Beretta they know was used to shoot John Newman. So, Detective Greg Newbury takes it for more intensive ballistics testing by an expert in Germany. He used twin uh, scanning electron microscopes. Uh, as such, he could, um, he could examine with an electron microscope um, two of the ballistics evidence, being the firearm, the cartridge cases and the projectiles. Uh, at the same time, at a, at a very minute, in very minute detail, which, uh, which eventually uh, allowed him to make the conclusion that uh, more, probably, more probably than not, uh, that firearm was the firearm that was used to kill John Newman. It's a new and important piece of evidence, the identification of what is likely to be the actual murder weapon. It's circumstantial, but put together with the phone tracking, it now has detectives and prosecutors far more confident about the upcoming trial. In 1999, more than three years since the brazen assassination of local Cabramatta Member of Parliament John Newman. His bitter political and personal rival, Fairfield councillor and one-time Vietnamese refugee Phong Ngo and two others have been charged with the murder thanks to a rollover witness, mobile telephone records and now a rusty pistol. Is he breathing at a pulse? In July 1999, Fong No, Tu Quang Dao and another man stand trial for the murder. But just two weeks in, the judge aborts the trial due to a technicality. A second trial begins in February 2000 and prosecutors now have extra evidence for their case. They have a second rollover witness, a self-confessed accomplice. The man, who has now become a protected witness, also tells of three other bungled and amateurish attempts on Newman's life. Uh, there was one at, uh, at a car park behind a restaurant in Cabramatta, where John Newman had been present at a dinner at which some presentations were to be made to citizens of the area, and they were waiting near the car park where his car was parked for him. The second one was at his home. They were lurking in the shadows of the bushes of his garden when he came home from a function one evening and drove up, parked his car in the driveway. By the time they came out, came out of the bushes, he'd already gone inside. 
And the third one was at a, at a, a dance at a, at a local community hall where John Newman was seen dancing, I think, with his then um, fiancée Lucy. And the plan was that they were going to attack him at the dance, but they realised there were too many people there and, and it would have been hard for them to escape. The new witness also corroborates the other protected witnesses' account of exactly what happened on the night of the murder. He also names the person he claims to have been the actual shooter. And as a result, a local Vietnamese man, David Din, becomes the third person facing murder charges. The second trial begins on schedule and runs for three months, but only Fong Ngo and the alleged driver to Quang Dao face this trial. David Din has been ordered to face a separate trial. Mark Tedeschi recalls the Crown case. There were two alleged co-offenders who gave evidence for the prosecution about the earlier attempts, uh, about the involvement of Fung Ngo, about how guns had been provided for this enterprise. Then there was evidence about the finding of a gun in the Georges River at Voyager Point. The gun is rusted through, but its firing pin is able to be fitted to another 1934 Beretta, which is then fired, and the spent shells compared to those found outside John Newman's home. This allows the German ballistics expert to say that it's highly probable that the rusty gun was the one used to kill John Newman. Then there was some mobile phone evidence from which we were able to trace the movements of Fung Ngo immediately after the shooting of John Newman. Hi, Shirley. It's Fung here. How are you? And it showed him proceeding yes, in a direction a which was towards Voyager Point when the gun had the been found. Gun? Oh, the prosecutor also presents the evidence from witnesses who saw Fong Ngo in a street at the rear of Newman's house and a green car at the front just two days before the murder. It's suggested that they were carrying out surveillance. After the lengthy trial, the jury retires to consider its verdict. But after six days, it returns unable to reach a unanimous decision. A single juror has held out and the trial is aborted for a second time. A third trial begins before Justice John Dunford at the Central Criminal Court on March 12, 2001. Now almost seven years since the murder. And this time, all three men appear together. It's June 28, 2001, when the jury returns to the packed courtroom. The three accused stand as the jury delivers its verdict. The first two accused, David Din and Tu Kwong Dao, are found not guilty. Then it's Fong No's turn, and when the jury foreman declares him guilty, Fong No sinks into his seat and crosses himself. The case against Dao and Din has been much weaker than that against Fong No, and the jury takes note of inconsistencies of various statements made by the protected witnesses regarding the pair. Outside the court, there are mixed reactions. David Din and Tu Quang Dao are naturally greatly relieved at their not guilty verdicts. For John Newman's family, it's a bittersweet result. All I can say is Fong they wanted the upper house, now he's got the upper bunk. <laughs> I hope he enjoys it. For fiancé Lucy Wang, now living in China, the news is some relief. I've lost a, a man I loved and a lot of happiness I may share with John. The mastermind of the Newman assassination is sentenced to life without the chance of parole. But although he's behind bars, Fong No's life sentence doesn't diminish his influence within his community. When first incarcerated here at Long Bay Jail, Fong No somehow arranges a Chinese New Year party catered for by an expensive Chinese restaurant 
which is attended by several Fairfield councillors, as well as the prison's most notorious criminals. There is public outrage and Fong No is transferred to the more secure Lithgow prison. But again, the arrogant assassin continues his evil and manipulative ways. In June 2003, prison authorities uncover evidence that Fong No is the mastermind behind a group called W2K for willing to kill and is planning an escape. The sternest of action is taken. No has become, in our opinion and our assessment, very dangerous. He is a covert operator who recruits other inmates to do his work for him. We do have some specific information about an escape attempt. As a result, Fong No is transferred to the state's most secure prison, Goulburn Supermax, which houses the most dangerous prisoners, serial killers, rapists and convicted terrorists. He is not allowed to mix with any other prisoner and spends all but one hour a day in his cell. This is a far cry from the Vietnamese refugee who risked his life for Australian freedom, who built up wealth and power and then was ruthless and arrogant enough to do something never done here before, organise a political assassination. I see myself just like a prostitute. I don't care who I sleep with, as long as I achieve things for the community that I represent. Coming up, to everyone's surprise, the case is reopened as Fong No gets yet another chance at freedom. In 2008, despite being firmly locked away in the state's toughest prison, Fong No spends four years lobbying human rights advocates who begin spreading sensational claims questioning the trial evidence. These claims are then run on national television. And some of those claims were firstly about the gun. The, the supporters of um, Fung No said, isn't this a miracle that um, three and a half years after the murder, it just happens to be found at the base of the, um, the pylon at the St George's River. You know, basically suggesting that the police had planted it there and the police divers went in, and wow, there it is. Other claims are made about the accuracy of the tracing of Fong No's mobile phone. The Newman assassination has resulted in three trials, a coronial inquiry and two appeals. The New South Wales Chief Justice suddenly announces a rare judicial inquiry to look into the claims. This means No's conviction could be quashed and a retrial ordered. The inquiry opens and police easily counter the suggestion that they planted the gun. And they'd already been searching for a day when the pistol was found. And the police, um, for this new inquiry, got in another expert who agreed that it had been in the river for the appropriate amount of time. The supporters' claims about the mobile phone tracing also fall flat because Fong No has actually previously admitted he was in the area. The judicial review is overseen by Judge David Patton, who finally rules that the original conviction was sound. The inquiry judge was particularly scathing about um, Fung No's supporters, you know, making pretty florid um, accusations that there was, you know, fraud, that the police had planted evidence, that, um, you know, the, somehow the uh, legal sides had, you know, withheld vital information. He basically said there is not a skerrick of truth to support that. But No continued his campaign, which finally ended when an attempt to appeal to the High Court in 2014 was refused. 20 years after the assassination.